Hello everyone and welcome back. Um, in today's video, we'll be going over part two in our top 10 series. In the previous video, we talked about hardware priorities and today we're gonna talk about software priorities. And in case you didn't see the previous video, uh, the way this works is it's something that I think everybody should do from time to time, maybe every two or three years, is just evaluate your setup. So evaluate your hardware setup, evaluate your software setup, and also think about maybe those 10 things and, and how important they are to you. So for example, in my list here, it's probably not going to be the same as it is to your list. So depending on what you do and how you make music and what you're going for, what you have at number one and what you have at number 10 might be totally swapped with what I have on this list. Um, or it's possible that you'll have um, things that aren't even on this list at all. So for example, I don't list analog modeled EQs in my top 10 software priorities. That might be really important to you. It might be a signature for your sound and what it is you're going for. It's not at all on mine, so it doesn't even get mentioned on this list, but there's nothing wrong with that maybe ranking in as high as number four or five um, for you. So again, the previous video, my computer is over there, so I'm gonna have to turn my head a lot of times. Hopefully that's not too annoying for you guys, but let's go ahead and get into it and we'll just talk more as we go through this. So for me, the uh, number one priority software speaking is your digital audio workstation. And um, for me, I'm currently using Bitwig and I'm using that for everything. So I don't go to any other digital audio workstations. I occasionally will use Audacity because that has like a white noise, brown noise generator. It has like tones that you can generate in Audacity. And um, it's usually easier to go and do it in there than to try to do some of that stuff in Bitwig. But um, otherwise, I really don't have a lot of complaints about the software. And the reason I give it an A is not because I'm saying if I did a review of Bitwig Studio, I would give it an A. But for me personally, and for what I need to do and the way that I make music and the way that like I get creatively inspired by the software, I give it an A because I'm not looking for anything else. I'm not looking for anything different. Um, if I had really stuck with Ableton Live and I was able to get through my issues with the timeline view, and I think it's a phenomenal piece of software, I just always had a tough time working in the arranger view on Ableton. Like I would probably still give, give that an A. I mean, there's a lot of people that I know use FL Studio and do great things with it. They're going to give it an A. Um, for people that aren't giving this an A under your digital audio workstation, it's very important that you probably go and you try to seek out and find the piece of software that's gonna work best for you. I, I always describe the DAW as that shell. And it's that crucial piece at the center of your studio that you're opening every single day that you're working with. And so you want to find um, the particular piece of software that gels and works best for you. Some people might be using a combination of things. That, again, is totally fine as long as you don't feel like it's slowing you up in any way. All right, number two priority. And this isn't really like a piece of software, but it's something that's going on inside the computer. And that would be an organized sample collection. So on my old setup, on my old system, and when I was doing this uh, more on a regular basis and I was taking it a lot more seriously, I probably got up to uh, a B minus. I, I had a pretty nice organized sample collection. Currently I don't. So currently I just have like a bunch of samples like all in some folders that are kind of like vaguely named and I just have way too much. Um, the thing that I encourage people to do, which I can't even say I'm doing now myself is, when you have like kick drums, for example, like when you're going through samples, whether they're samples that come with your digital audio workstation, they're, they're stuff you found on the internet, they're things you've recorded yourself, you really want to try to narrow it down. Like there's no reason why you would ever need more than say 100 kick drums in your collection. Maybe you could have 100 acoustic kicks, maybe you have 100 um, electronic kicks, but Apart from that, you're going to get into that, that problem, that problem area that so many of us face where you're just sample searching, you're just previewing, previewing, and you're never going to find the thing that's perfect. You have something in your head that's going to work, but you just never can find it. Like, for example, currently, I feel like all I would need are a few acoustic um, hits and then like the Lindrum kick drum sample. And like, that's pretty much all I would need for everything that I'm working on and making currently. That sounds wild, I know, but like, that's probably all I would need as it relates to kicks. Um, and that's true for like all of your samples and like what you have and, and, and what you're going to pull to. What you'll find is that with these top five, top four or five things, if you're at an A on all of these things, you're probably super efficient and you're very productive. 
um, in outputting music and, and that circles back around to what you're trying to do. But for me, an organized sample collection is really important because it doesn't slow you up. Like you're able to continue to go quick. When you need to grab a drum, you can bring that in. When you need a vocal hit, you can find it. You can bring it in. When you need a texture, like a real world sound, you have a folder that just has maybe a hundred of those sounds that within, within a minute or two, you can kind of preview almost everything and find something that works as opposed to what most of us have, which is just an enormous amount of samples that we're constantly sorting through and trying to find something. And at the end of the day, nothing works for us. Let's move on now to number three. Oh my gosh, look, it's much related to number two, which would be an organized preset collection. Now, if you're the sort of person that you just refuse to use presets, this isn't even going to be on your list. And that's totally fine. Um, the more that I've done music production stuff, the more I've relied very heavily on presets and just kind of doing preset tweaking. And again, to me, inside of Bitwig, there's a lot of great ways that you can organize presets regardless of the synthesizer that you have. And again, for me, it comes back to what I said before. With like bass patches, I don't think that I would need more than maybe 20 starting points for pluck bass and sustain bass. Um, electronically speaking. Like I might find a few from all the synthesizers I have in my collection, and that's a good enough starting place for me to then go and do whatever it is I need to do with the sound. So having an organized preset collection, having presets that you've starred and that you've favorited or you've created yourself, again, it goes a long way in being really efficient as um, a music producer. And I think that's an area we can all improve on. Even in the past, I, I would be really bad with this. My sound design skills are relatively good um, so I can do stuff from scratch, but I'm at that point where I really just don't even want to anymore. So I remember hearing somebody say this quote, and this was a long time ago. They said something like, you know, it's totally okay to use presets if you know how to make the sound from scratch. And that's kind of where I'm at now, where I figure, why would I make the sound from scratch? Like if I can just find that preset, but it is, it is about finding the preset. And sometimes that's easier said than done. Um, and maybe at the end, we'll do a wrap up where I kind of talk about, you know, how you can improve some of these areas and in understanding like how much time you should be dedicating to different areas. Um, and again, totally subjective, but I, I, from my experience, I hope this can be helpful. Uh, let's move on to number four, somewhat related, um, production and mixing templates. Currently I give myself a D I have a few custom templates that I've created, but I haven't really been using them. So, you know, again, um, I'm, I'm the case. I'm the best case study for somebody telling people what to do and like not really doing it myself, but I'm, we're all trying, right? We're all striving. So with this one here, this is really dependent again on what you're trying to accomplish. When I was at my best, and when I say best, I really just mean most efficient, most uh, prolific in getting stuff done and really being, uh, you know, actually being productive. Um, was when I was always kind of working off of templates, mixing templates, especially if you're a music producer that does your own mixing and you always tend to go to those same effects and you tend to go to those same things, you need to have those presets saved or you need to have templates saved so that you can really speed things up so that you're not wasting that time pulling it up, you know, pulling up the EQ putting that filter move in or having to select the type of filter you want, things like that. Like, you know what you're going to do before you even do it. And so having those production and mixing templates goes a long way. If you're a beginner, this isn't as important because you're still trying to learn all of those things. But for people that are even, even past that to advanced beginner or intermediate stages with doing this stuff, um, I've always found that having this is, is very useful. Um, and it's something that, again, I need to work on and, and, if, especially if I'm going to continue to make music, which I, I said in the last video, like I'm not really doing that much with it anymore. But um, when I was, you know, this was very important to me. Uh, number five, um, for someone like me and what I do, software synths and multi-samples, so things for contact, so multi-sampled instruments, very important for me. And I have more than enough. I probably have too much. Um, so these are some of the companies and some of the things that I do have and I do use on a regular basis. I've got stuff from Yuhi. I use Spire a lot. Uh, Serum, sometimes. I have some stuff from Tall, um, Arturia, Korg, Roland. Um, and I'd give myself an A in this category because I don't need any more. It fulfills my needs and it's way beyond what I'd ever even need um, to, make, to make the music that I want to make. Moving on to number six, 
Um, MIDI collection, so like MIDI file collection, it, hopefully organized again, that's very important, as well as MIDI plugins. So the two MIDI plugins that I use are Scalar and Sidhulu. I have no idea how you pronounce that, so apologies. Um, and I'd give myself a C here because I'm pretty happy with the plugins. And I have a pretty good collection that I've kind of amassed over the years or of things that I've even saved myself, but it's not as organized as I'd like it to be. And that's an area I can improve on. But it, again, it kind of comes back to what I'm talking about before with this organization and kind of having your favorites already picked out. Um, because with drum beats and drum grooves, like I'm a big believer in saving those as MIDI files and bringing them into other projects. Um, it, it can really just jumpstart things. And with a lot of genres of music, you might as well start with that kind of template, um, especially for drums and things, and even different bass lines. I can definitely speed things up. And there's, there's only so many combinations at work. And there's times where you just don't need to reinvent the wheel. And I think people try to reinvent the wheel. Um, when if you just kind of had, you know, 100, 200 MIDI files that you could go back to and get you started. Um, and really, again, it can, it can help you out um, a lot. Uh, number seven for me, so I... I classify these as colors or tone shapers. So um, distortion, saturation, excitation. For me, these are important. These are ways of taking your samples and also taking your more digital plasticky sounding software synthesizers and trying to do something to them um, to give them a, a little bit more color, a little more interest, something that can make the sound be a little bit different to what everybody else has. And again, I'm way on the overkill on this, this category. I have way too much, but some things I use, Satin, Realbus, SDRR. Um, I really like this plugin called Lux. Um, Decapitator, I know that that one has a really bad rap for some reason, something to do with like aliasing, but I've used it a lot and I've always really liked what it does. Some of the stuff from Air Windows is really impressive, especially for the subtleties, uh, as well as RC20, which again is one of these, these plugins that everybody uses and it's getting used way too much, but it does what, it does what you want it to do, so you can't complain. Um, for me, that's an A. Again, overkill. For my style of music, though, this ranks at a 7, where some people might be saying, well, like, what about reverb? You know, what about this? What about that? Again, that can totally be ranked higher up on your list. Um, let's go on to number eight, which is reverb and reverb variance is kind of what I stress here. So being able to access all different types of reverb. So I think pretty much everything I have, I don't think there's a convolution reverb that I use at all. So maybe I should give myself an A minus, but I don't really need convolution reverb um, in my life. So the stuff I use, Valhalla, um, the Arts Acoustic Reverb, and some of the stuff from Exponential Audio. I'm trying to remember which one I use a lot of. It might be the cheap one, Phoenix Verb. Not really sure, but those would be the three that I go to. And again, for me, it's an A because I just don't need anything else. It does what I want. Uh, number nine, loudness. So we have limiters, clippers, compressors. Um, for me and for just like electronic music in general, loudness and specifically like limiting and clipping are really important and sometimes overlooked. So people love to throw compressors on, but they're using the compressor really more as like a maximizer where a limiter or a clipper might be a better option for you. Uh, so the stuff from TDR, uh, DMG, Klanghelm, all quality stuff, those are the, those are the companies. Um, and again, I don't need anything more than that. That's always been sufficient for me. This is the one area where I honestly feel like I've done a good job of not like overspending. Like I feel like I've kind of hit, hit the nail on the head and it does what I want it to do. Um, so for me, that's going to be an A. And then number 10 is metering. And the metering is both for loudness and it's also for having a VU meter, having access to that when you are using the analog model plugins that if you need to see where you're at, like VU wise, it can work out for you. Um, I'd give myself an A here. Um, I, I don't even use them all the time, but you know, from time to time I do. So uh, the big thing for us to, I think, wrap up on with this video is understanding like how to use your time. And in, in a couple of like final thoughts, the first final thought is when it comes to software and it comes to plugins, starting with the DAW, I gave myself an A. Looking at meters, I've given myself an A. Loudness, reverb, color, um, the software sense, all of these things are A's. I, and, and this is the problem. This is the world we live in. I get it. I'm just as guilty of it as anybody else. But there's always that feeling of I need another toy in order to do what I want to do. And I'm telling you guys nine times out of 10, maybe 19 out of 20, that's usually not the case. That's usually not the thing that's holding you up. That's not the hiccup um, in the chain of command. 
So when we talked about this on the hardware, you know, there's that idea that that comfort, the comfort of your studio, the chair you have, um, you know, the lighting, the room itself, like that can that can be much more important than the toys in your in your toy box, if you will. Um, and when we look at the things that I need improvement on, these are areas that are not sexy, they're not fun, but they are extremely important. They are very valuable to me. So when you think about it, and I think I said this in the last video, or I've certainly said it before, there are a very small number of people, there's probably five to 10%, maybe even less than that, of the music production community of, of music producers in general that can sit there and can be really effective and do really amazing things for more than two hours at a time. I am not one of those people. So when it comes to me making a track, it is rare that I have a sit down, that I am at the computer being productive, being efficient for more than two hours. Um, that sounds kind of crazy, right? Because you're thinking, well, 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 shouldn't you be able to do that for five, six hours? Isn't this a passion of yours? Isn't that something you should be able to do? And maybe for some people, but not for me. Um, I'm definitely human in that regard. And, um, and that's where when you're thinking about a day, a studio day, and especially if in these categories, you're at Fs and you're at Ds and you have room for improvement, even at a C, that's where after you've done that two hours that maybe you kind of take that hour break and you go through and you do just listen to presets or you do just kind of go through your samples and you start to pick out the stuff that you really like and you start to bump these grades up. And what that means for you then long-term is when you are in those two hour, three hour blocks where you're being really efficient, really productive, your life becomes easier. So you're not wasting that two hours on browsing for presets. And I know we've all been there. Um, I've definitely been there many times where you're making really good progress on a track and suddenly it's like, ooh, I've got this bass sound that I know what it is, I know what I want, and you end up scanning through presets and you end up trying like eight different synthesizers. Two and a half hours later, you haven't accomplished anything. And you and, and for me, at least a lot of times, you come back the next day and you listen to what you ended up putting down. You go, oh, crap, I got to... I got to start this over and do it again. Um, so anyway, that was my top 10 software priorities for me personally as a computer music producer. Um, for you guys, might be very different. And what I recommend, again, is every two or three years, you maybe make this list. And for some people, right, for some people under software since, you know, maybe you don't have anything, but you're realizing that's your big hiccup. Like you need some more variety in your like software synthesizer. Like everything is sounding very plastic. You know, there was a time way back in the day where it felt like every single sound was being used, made with massive. And there was kind of just this, this massive, like, um, oversaturation. And it just got to that point where you could hear a song, you go, Oh, yep. That's definitely, that's definitely a massive patch. And I think if you were in that boat, you suddenly realized, and I was in that boat too, you suddenly realized like, Ooh, you know, I need to get something different. I need to spice it up. So I'm not saying that everybody is going to be at, at all A's in their, in their plugin collection. And, and you don't necessarily want to be, that's not something that I'm necessarily proud of here. It means that I've fallen into that trap of needing the new toy when I really should have maybe focused on something different. Um, but yeah, anyway, I hope this has been useful. And if you have any questions or anything like that, please let me know. I know I'm not super responsive not as much as I used to be. I'm doing a lot of different things. So um, I'll try my best. And it's not, be, it's not a lag. It's not like I'm that busy of a person. I just, I just end up not looking at it. So that is on me. I'm going to try to do a little bit better with that. And uh, hopefully in the coming couple months, we will have a video every single week for you guys to digest. Um, we might go back into more of the technical stuff. And yeah, we'll see how things go. So thanks for watching and take care.